Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. It's a special episode of Beyond the Frame. Well, special in the sense that we've got a returning guest. As you can see, <laughs> my, <laughs> it's Tweak or Antique number two. Oh, oh. Dan Patterson from Saber Lanes, The Art of Bowling. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Ooh, thank you for having me, Jake. I think we need some uh, music for our show, Tweak or Antique. Da -da 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 okay, maybe not that music. That's, what is yeah, that from, not. anyway? That's from a game show, guaranteed. <laughs> Um, if you're joining us live, hey, I'm watching off to the side here, so when my head turns, I'm looking at you. Um, say hi. Uh, maybe I'm looking at you. I don't know if I can see it or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's comments over there. So uh, feel free to ask any questions you want us. We're talking today about, if you read our little post beforehand, it said, need extra cash? Who doesn't? Do you? I mean, we're yes. headed to Vegas for nationals in a few days here, so <laughs> we can use all the extra cash you want. Do you want to send a tip or what are they doing? What are, what are those kids doing now? Coins, tipping? What is that called? Venmo or Coinbase? No, there's a thing cryptos? like on Facebook, you send them a tips or coins. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Yeah, Somehow it's magical money that shows up in the people's account. <laughs> so if you have a bowling center, <laughs> if you have an entertainment <laughs> facility, accept the tips and figure out that out and let us know because royalties uh, buy new carpet or buy new <laughs> vending machines, which we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. So today we have on our list um, a lot of ways that you can add ancillary revenue to your bottom line. Um, traditional stuff, stuff that you would absolutely imagine considering doing to add this money to your bottom line. But we're going to look at them with a little bit more of a critical eye maybe and critical from our point of view because we are, we tend to look at things differently as a whole, don't you think, Dan? Oh. <laughs> I'll say, Jay, that's why there's opportunities everywhere, but it's also why when you and I, and we know a ton of them, find good proprietors or people that are spending money in the right spots, then we ask them all the questions because we want to know what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and is it successful? And then we take it for our own. Yeah, so we're absolutely. hoping today that we can do the exact same thing to some other people. Correct, correct. So let's let's uh, let's dig right in with the topic. I'm going to start out with, uh, so, so I've seen this concept as an entire business, like a barcade, uh, vintage video, mm -hmm. pinball, etc. What do you think about vintage, uh, vintage arcade games, so to speak? I'm not opposed to it. My main worry that I haven't moved forward with that is I'm worried about the maintenance. I think there are some centers around that have these amazing facility managers. They already have a nice amusement center and adding that on, I think if they, depending on the center size, would be a nice addition. But I'm worried that I get these games and they go down and how much money am I paying to get there? There's the stress of it always worried about getting down, getting new parts. Um, so it doesn't excite me, but I think there are environments that are completely set up for it that might be right for it. So for you, it's kind of an antique. For me, I'd say it's an absolute yeah. tweak, especially if you don't have redemption in your center already. Maybe you're a traditional center and you don't have a big footprint to have that full-fledged redemption with those large mm. games and cranes. Maybe this is your way to have a little niche area where you get, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 vintage titles that you know someone locally that helps you repair them when you need to be, mm. because there's certainly this culture of we can fix anything nowadays, just go to YouTube and you're done. So I, I like it. I like the idea of it. I, of course, I'm old, so I like to go and play Ms. <laughs> Pac-Man. Actually, my favorite game of all time is Mr. Do. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> n not Nintendo. N I don't remember the name of it, the company that did it. So vintage video pinball, vintage uh, our arcade games. I say it's a tweak. Do it right. If you're going to do it, commit to it. Find that right space and, and uh, make your extra cash from it, right? Right. I, w I wish I was excited as excited about this. You're not. Right. Hey, I guess. No, I don't know. If, why. I, if I had a full fledged, you know, FEC and I had a really nice game room, like yeah. John Lucido, and he's not going to be putting vintage uh, pinball and whatnot in his, yeah. probably in his redemption area. I don't, you know, that yeah. doesn't match up right. Anyway, all right, let's move on to an, this one I'm pretty passionate about lottery, lotto, pull tabs, scratch mm. off. Okay. For me, for me personally, <laughs> put that on the shelf. That's an antique. I personally don't want to make the state of X any more money than I have to. Um, because let's just take New York, for example, when I ran centers there with, with AMF, what was the return on lottery revenue in New York? It was supposed to be 6%. 
but <laughs> show me anybody that makes six percent off it and i'll show you a unicorn because there's all <laughs> kinds of fees that come out of there the way that it's structured you get you have to pay for your books of tickets mm -hmm. after x number of days you might not have sold those yet they might be still sitting in the machine there's a whole bunch of uh variables that end up the real take home was like around four percent and i looked at that and said I can make more than 4% on a dollar on so many other opportunities that my bowling, my customers, my league, whatever it may be, the reason why I have that there, they would find that just as attractive. So for me, it's an antique, but you have a little bit different spin because you're in a state that has legalized gambling. Well, that's right. I'm going to I'm going to be a little two faced because I also managed a bowling center in New York and I did the same thing. We got rid of the lotto. We got rid of the scratch offs because everybody said, well, you know, these people love them. And we have a line of people coming in to play their numbers, getting the Powerball. But then you were the one that actually told me this. And then when I saw it firsthand after about a year, I got full on board. And that's when we got rid of them is that people only bring a certain amount of money to the bowling center. And so if they're spending that on all the lotto and the scratch offs, they may not have enough money to buy their chicken wings that night, their soda, a pizza, an extra game, like it's just all gone. So we got rid yep. of it. But then, then I moved to a state like Wisconsin and we can have these five regular video gaming machines like a slot machine and the revenues and our margins on those are so good that it's a no brainer. You put them on the side, they sit there, very low maintenance, split the money with a uh, service that's gonna take a little bit because now you don't have to deal with any of that. Um, but we've seen that actually attribute to the bottom line. So it, it's very state dependent, I think. Well, I've been in your center. <laughs> I've played those five machines as a customer <laughs> and I watched customers come in the door at your center just to play those machines right. and buy alcohol. So for right. you in that market, 100%. And, and I'm gonna even go back on my little antique thing. If you run you know, a facility that has this uh, base that plays quick draw or you know a live drawing game maybe maybe you need to keep that component because maybe that's one of the reasons why they come to your facility for their league or for the tournament or they come for their open play night or whatever so i think you need to balance that but you do need to ask yourself the hard question what is my return on dollars that are getting put into this particular item and can i make that same amount with less effort or more effort or whatever so you have to balance that out and that's kind of going to be the same for everything that we talk about but with lottery it was very apparent to me so that's yeah, our well said okay good all right we're going to move on let's talk about a pro shop <laughs> <laughs> all, hey, also, perks of being in a casino, Dustin Russell just posted. Yeah, well, if I was at Angel the Wins Casino, I wouldn't need to have lottery in my year. <laughs> By the way, did you know that Dustin's house balls, this is genius. Dustin's house balls are sponsored by one of the gaming companies. So their, oh, their wow. slot machines have all their logos mm. on the house balls. A plus plus, Dustin. It looks fabulous, first of all, and uh, it really fits well with your stuff. Um, That's awesome. But pro shop, speaking of house balls, pro shop though, um, what do you think of a pro shop? You've just remodeled your pro shop. Mm -hmm. Well, and we came at it from a different way because we were starting basically from the ground up. Uh, we got a center that did not have a lot of legacy league bowlers and the legacy league bowlers we have are not the big high average 220 boomers. So we're really catering to that first time bowler. And my main thing, and you've heard me say this so much, is that we have to be nice. And the antique for pro shops is these old, legacy operators that own and see a large portion of your businesses and they are just curmudgeoned. The shop smells, it's cluttery, and it gives you a bad look. This is and not some of them are customers. elitist. They have these bad yep. mentality. Yep. How they talk dare down. you question yep. me? And you yep. should know that no, that's oh. not retail. Nobody's gonna Don't go in a shop that treats you like that. No, you get intimidated. I have stories from going in golf. Usually those are the ones that I get intimidated going to a golf pro shop. Mm. And it's very few times I've walked into a golf pro shop and felt welcomed. And like, I can ask a dumb question, like what's this club? And I don't even understand what that means and sure. get a nice attention. Usually, like you say, it's a little bit elitist and it's strange to use elitist with bowling, but we all know <laughs> the pro shops we're talking about, right? Yeah, so sadly. antique those pro shops, shut those down, put in the vintage games. I am so over that right. kind of service. What are you stuff. getting in revenue for rent on that little square right. footage? $75 a month. I mean, come not on. Even uh, that's true. In the, in the right. Midwest, the average the average rent for most pro shops in the Midwest is like $125 a month. It is insanity. Oh my Lord, you could yeah. come yeah. on. You could sell 
bag pretzels out of that space and make more money. <laughs> but now, so this is where I'm all, I'm all on board with the tweak because if you have this facility that is that has the right audience, like you just mentioned, an audience that either has a great amount of you know competitive players, league players, or even tournament mm -hmm. players, you mm -hmm. need that. You want that service to be yep. able to be in your facility. You want yep. people to come there and go, oh, I can get my ball resurfaced. Oh, I can have grips changed. Oh, yep. I might buy a new ball. People who aren't, you know, pro shop specific because there's mm -hmm. plenty of those that are still out there. So yep. I think you need to look at pro shop. If you don't have the right staff to run it, if you're going to just lease Bingo. it out, you better, have, you better have some contingency there. You better have some say in what that person's personality is like, what their Bingo. business is like. You can't just say, oh, you want to give me 200 bucks? Come on in and do what you want because that's, that's recipe for disaster in my opinion, so. Well, and that's it. Everything is a reflection in your center. If it's under your four walls, it doesn't matter if it's leased or it's one of your associates or somebody that comes there, one of your regulars. It's a reflection on your business. What and are you, you going to do? Managing, if you're Can not going to manage sign those, up to all your customers, by the way, we don't own the pro shop. We <laughs> yeah. don't care. Those people don't work for us. They don't care. They don't know they it. Don't they don't care. don't care. No. It's so. your fault. Right. It's a yeah, bad reflection. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, service is number one for a pro shop. Uh, you yeah. are not a retail environment as much as you think you are. And if you do, 100%. you're probably not IPSIA certified because they're going to teach you right off the bat. You're not a, you're not Walmart. You're not a retailer. You are a service provider. Every excellent pro shop that I know doesn't consider themselves a retailer. They consider themselves an expert service provider that happens to sell stuff sometimes. 100 percent. Right? you couldn't have said it better the last thing i'll say with pro shops real quick is that if you're going to add one or tweak one like you want to then you need to not only make sure it's the right personality but they're there to help you sell your business they're going out on the lanes they're doing other things that drive that revenue in at the hours you need them to be also if your league starts at seven and they close at five what good is oh, it to your league bowler yes Thank you. I mean, how many times does that happen? The pro shops are open every day, noon to five. Well, that's yeah. right. Some of us work for a living. So I have to take a day off to come get my ball yeah. refinished. I don't know. Yeah. You see where I'm going. So anyway, yeah. okay, let's leave pro shop there because we, we just made um, enemies of a lot of people probably. <laughs> we don't, but listen, if you're one of these pro shop operators and some of this stuff is stinging you, you might want to just look and go, why does it sting me? Because maybe there's room for you to improve as well. Maybe there's room for you to say, Am I leaving money on the table? Am I looking at my business the right way? A lot. Ooh. Do you know the margins on first time bowlers? They don't just go in there to buy a high performance bowling ball and it can be very particular. They buy that ball. You know what they need in that ball or to carry it with? They need a bag. Then they want shoes. Then they want to upgrade. And then they want lessons. That and is they gold. need a spare ball. And uh, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. The, what, once someone has the fish hook in their cheek went for bowling, you reel that fish in a long way before you get it to the boat. And there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of line out there, if you know yeah. what I'm saying. Okay. You're catching those dollars, yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's move on to another equally uh, passionate topic, which is <laughs> vending. Oh, God. Okay. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, you start because I don't, I can't. You know, I've ping pong on this in the past because similar, it depends on your center size and what you can do. If you don't have a kitchen, of course, vending is probably a decent option for you. Um, and I know you are actually going to go and take this a step further, but I'll stick with traditional vending machines, chips, possibly soda. Any center that I've had that has any size of kitchen, it can be a closet. But if you have a grill and deep fryers, get rid of all of that and have the kitchen. Oh, my gosh, don't get me started. Have <laughs> the kitchen open every second you're open. Don't close yeah, it a half why hour before you? it closed. Don't have it not open till five o'clock. You are losing money. And if you don't have associates, you can't be cross-trained, you can't keep, uh, teach to cook French fries, you are losing such a margin on people coming to your business and spending that food and beverage money. So vending machines, I am so against, unless you have no other option to sell that food and beverage. But if you can sell food and you can have fountain soda, do not have vending machines in your business. The margins are too great on the other side. Okay, so there's your answer. I say, <laughs> I agree with absolutely everything there. But what fries me beyond fr crispy, I mean, this is like past crispy. <laughs> when I'm at a facility and all I want is a freaking candy bar, I just need a something. And the only Sweet. thing I can get mm -hmm. from a snack bar comes from a deep fryer or a grill or is $9. I don't, I just want a candy bar. <laughs> like, how hard is this? Can I just have something to snack up? A, a granola bar, something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you don't have that option available, why not? I mean, that's something that's easy to administer over the snack bar. Okay, so your mm -hmm. my employees eat them all. Oh my God, figure it out. It's $20. <laughs> Tell them they can have one every day, but you know, whatever. I don't know. There's a way to do this, right? But I'm looking at vending with a different eye. 
If you've not been to IAPA, I really encourage you to go. If you're owner operator of an, any type of entertainment industry, you should be at IAPA. What is IAPA? IAPA stand for? Uh, International Association of Amusement Parks and something, something, something. IAAPA. Just look it up online. November, Orlando. Huge trade show. It's coming back this year. Thank the Lord. But what happens at IAPA is if you are in any kind of business, Oh, Dan and Koniak, I can't ever say his last name right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, it's a great advice from two of the best. <laughs> We've fooled one person so far. Um, uh, so what I'd like to say about vending is if you're not having come to IAPA, if you can imagine it being sold, it can be sold from a vending machine. I'll tell you what, in the Asian culture, I think it's China or Japan. I don't know enough about Asian culture, but I do know that it's very ritualistic that you can buy, like you go and get whole meals there. That's just the way it is. You go get mm -hmm. your sandwich or your whatever out of a vending. So they're used to this mm -hmm. culture, but they have their masters of innovation, right? And what did they have last IAPA? They had a cotton candy vending machine. Yeah. No, I'm not talking that package crap that you can get at the dollar store. That's I'm talking a robot that took a stick and you picked what you want your cotton candy to look like, a flower, a boat, a uh, Statue oh. of Liberty. It didn't, they had like <laughs> 20 different designs with multiple colors in the design. That's awesome. And this robot went <laughs> and the thing came down and pressed it and put more on. And when it was done, it handed you this four color flower. Each color was a different flavor. It wow. was like three bucks four bucks. I would have bought 10 of them in any visit. <laughs> it was unbelievable. The machine was like $1,500. I'm like, can I just oh, wow. get one for the house? Yeah. This was amazing. So no, what, I, was... what I, what I, what I, what I want to say about uh, vending is rethink vending. If you have square footage that you uh, can afford to use for vending, why not look at vending from a different angle? Yes. Offer the snacks, offer the chips and the candy bars can soda if you have to because you don't have fountain fine i get it i prefer one of those um snapple type machines where you can see all the bottles you know that one the front glass front door that's better but look at things like ice cream look at things like cotton candy look at things like a hot food item that can be done easily and cheaply and the margins are really good on so that's my thing on vending i say it's a tweak you say it's mostly an antique okay <laughs> anything more to add Oh, you've, you've won me back with the cotton candy machine. And you mentioned the thing at the end. It's all about the margins. I've just seen the margins are so bad on most vending and you have to stock them up and you can't never have anybody. You can't have everything for everyone. No. So it really is. It's an, it depends. But when you give out the details like that, that you're winning me back to tweet. You know, and even five years ago, um, even a lot more than that, when you walked into a stations casino, I remember this trend was huge. Uh, you'll remember it the minute I say, you walk down to Texas station and you know that big area off the escalators as you came down, what did they have in the middle of that? They had a gigantic turn round thing with about 70 bubble gum machines where you put the uh, yeah, that's in right. and you yeah. would, and they had a changer right there. You can get $5 <laughs> worth right. of quarters. They had little yeah. plastic bags. Yeah. You would yeah. put five bucks in and crank. I would yeah. get my runs. I would get my Skittles, my <laughs> M&Ms. I mean, that was genius. And yeah. that went through a big phase for a while. And it's still yeah. valid. I mean, I'll still throw a quarter in there every now and then. The problem is nobody has quarters anymore. So you got to figure <laughs> a different way to do it. But anyway, so vending is still, a, it's a valid option, but you got to do it right. You can't leave it skanky looking. You got to be on top of it and Thank make you. sure it works Thank for you. your business model. Thank right, you. I was going to end with, I was going to end with that real quick. The pro shop, you have to own the environment, make sure it looks like what you want. Same with your vending machines. Don't get something, you know, old and crappy, make it vintage and cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go off on a tangent here. Learn to bowl clinics. What do you think yeah. about learn to bowl clinics? Oh my. Um, I think they're extremely valuable as long as they're done right. It almost goes back to that pro slot philosophy. You have the right person running that program, then you can develop a bowler that'll be in your building for the next 30 years. So yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of it, but like most things, it's all about the people. So this isn't about the program, mm -hmm. it's not about the structure, and it's not about running it. You have to find the right person. And you remember, I said this a lot in the last show, and I'm going to bring it back. It can't be you. You can't be running everything in your building unless you're so passionate about coaching, which I love to coach, but it's exhausting. You're already talking to your associates. You're doing all of the banking. You know what I mean? You're managing your customer base. And then to go out and actually coach somebody, you're already tired. So you have to find these people that are untethered, great personalities, nice, energetic, and they're going to, and they're going to drive that, then you're going to have customers for life. So that's a big, it depends, right person, then go. 
So I have a look, a different view on this. I say, look, it depends on your audience too. If I am a more traditional league-based center, there may be value in a learn to bowl program for my casual customers that I'm trying to convert to come in more, more frequently. But if I'm just doing it because I want to have something that like teaches people to be better, I don't need to run that. Why don't I get a Brad Angelo? Why don't I get Deandra Asbady? Why don't I get Mark Baker? Why don't I get all these high, uh, look, there's like four or five um, really big names of clinics and coaching clinics. And then that's just national. Then let's yeah. talk regional, you know? Yeah. I remember in Buffalo, the one that would sell out every year with, and uh, it was just crazy. So yes, there is a very, very good position for any type of getting better, learning the sport better. But does it have to come from Sabre Lanes? It can be hosted by Sabre Lane, mm -hmm. but you don't have to put it all together. So here's the downfall <laughs> of XYZ Bowl. Um, they're like, we're going to do a learn to bowl league. Now, I, as a customer, whenever I walk into a new facility or if I'm new at something, I always am looking for a deal and I want to try to, you know, get the best. But there's a point where you've reached when you when you talk about pricing and what you get, where it seems like, ew, this isn't gonna be good because it's like free or like it's three dollars a week mm -hmm. and I get a ball and I get all this stuff and I'm like mm -hmm. So it look you have to look at the totality of what the program looks like to the average person. And yes, you want to make it affordable, but guess what? Nobody is going to um no I can't say that. Let me rephrase that. Not everybody's looking for the cheapest outcome. Some yeah. people want quality. Some people want to know that they're yeah. getting like the best of the best or even the mid range. Maybe I don't want to spend, maybe I don't want Jonathan, what's his name to come decorate my house, but I'll settle for, you know, this new chick that just won whatever, you know, HGTV show that was. I can't afford the property brothers, but I could afford her, right? Like, and she's good. So it's the same mentality could be true here. Um, but I certainly don't want, Sarah down the street that's going to charge me $50 for this, you know, $100,000 project. That's her cut. Like, I don't think that matches up to me. Like she's doing it for free because nobody wants to pay her. So the same kind of mentality could be looked at as these learn to bowl clinics. What is the totality of the package? What are you offering? Yes. Oh, it's a, you know, it's a $69 cost for seven weeks of bowling and you get this hundred dollar ball in all the bowling. And I look at that as a customer going, well, how are they making any money on this? And why is it, is mm -hmm. there really anything there to me? Are they just telling me it's this much? So look at what you're doing carefully. I think you're better off supporting the people who do this more often than trying to do it on your own. But if you have the staff, if you have the right guy in the pro shop, there's nothing wrong with running a program. Just make sure you price it accordingly. Make sure you're getting your return on it. And, you know, those people are going to become customers and you're going to make revenue off of them far more than this six times that they come in for this clinic. So don't be stressed about making money off them. You're not yeah. going to run away because you charge them $20 a week versus $12 a week. You know, that's the mentality I think we worry about. So I agree. It's all about value. Well, uh, not not antique because we always want to develop new ballers, but certainly always look at it with a tweak eye. Uh, out, uh, let's do rental shoes. What do you think about your um, rental shoe program? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was just seeing an ad, and I don't know what bowling digest or magazine it was in, but it was something with those little shoes, those little slip on covers mm -hmm. to sell. And I can't remember where that was from, but I looked at that and then I really kind of thought through it. Um, I Allowing think people to are, use their own shoes, right? They do, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, it depends on the market you're in, right? Yes. Um, but as far go as the, overseas, and that's all they have, right? Oh, that's true. Right. Hollywood Bowl doesn't require rental shoes. Well, and that's a different kind of. When we start talking about those big FECs and stuff like that, the game changes a lot. So I assume the people that are tuning into this and talking a lot are either smaller centers, not quite FECs, but even FECs that still have traditional stuff like rental shoes and that. I assume that's the market we're kind of going for. Cause I agree. Right. I would love to have a center where I never had to deal with another rental shoe because there's so many other things that that's a smaller portion of the revenue. You really don't need that revenue. It doesn't quite make sense anymore, but for the centers that do need it and do have it, the ROI on a rental shoe is still so phenomenally good. The thing that I please ask everybody, like with your pro shop, like with your vending machines, don't hand somebody when you charge them three or three fifty, and you better be at least charging that at a minimum rental shoes that have holes and are tearing apart because you're the not Velcro just doesn't stick. you're not you're not just creating bad looks for that center you're creating bad looks for bowling yeah 
they're yeah. thinking, oh, it's bowling. They always have shitty shoes, crappy balls, pardon my language. Um, old, 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 nasty looking. You know what I mean? It just, it just, it, it gives waves out there. And those people aren't motivated to bowl again because everybody wants right. to be in a little bit of a nicer atmosphere. Especially so with still, the COVID eye. They're like, I'm putting, I'm putting my hand or uh, my foot in that. No, I get yeah. it. I get it. So I'm still you a know, fan of rental shoes. Go I'm on. a fan of them too. I, I think you're teaching, you're teaching the, um, you're teaching the sport mm, correctly. If there is such a thing, I hate to say that. I sound like such a purist now. I'm the person I really don't <laughs> like listening to sometimes. But no, for real, yeah. if I had uh, a re revenue stream from rental shoes, I wouldn't want it to go away unless I was replacing it with something that was at least equal, if not better. But I want to provide my consumers and my my guests with the best experience. And if that experience is I'm not charging for rental shoes, I've included them in the price, I've got taken price up, then that mm -hmm. actually works for me. I've seen centers that are very successful doing mm -hmm. that. Our rental shoes are included. What size do you need? The objections become much less. The maintenance on the lane becomes much less, especially mm -hmm. if you have wooden approaches. If you have wooden approaches, you have to make them wear rental shoes. You know, Hollywood Bowl and, and some of these other chains that aren't requiring the rental shoes, they're getting away with it because you have synthetic approaches. And unless they have like some rock in their shoe, it's probably not a, as bad. Yeah. But, um, and you know, it's humorous because every one of us that works in a bowling center have bowled without rental shoes on or bowling shoes on a billion times in our life. And we didn't, you know, kill the lane. So why would we expect <laughs> the customers to just magically kill it too? Because we know I, I more than they do, Jay. We know more than they do. You're right. <laughs> but but re rental shoes are an important oh. revenue a revenue source for so many people do it right offer an upsell do you are you including socks with those rental shoes that's the value proposition right i really don't want to buy shoes but i have to they make me oh but i get a free pair of socks okay i'll take them you know what i mean like it's it's less of a heartburn for me and socks are 50 60 cents a pair if you're lucky so you know even if you sold uh upsell of socks for a dollar you'd still make you know, 40, 50% margin or 100% margin there. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, rental shoes are, are definitely a tweak. I, I wouldn't say we would ever antique them, but look at what you're doing with rental shoes and ask yourself, does it match your brand? Does it match what you're trying to do with your business? And is there a way that, you know, you can make it better for your guest experience? Okay, I'm done with rental shoes because I think we spent <laughs> way too much time on it. Uh, event spaces. Now you're the king of event spaces in Menasha, Wisconsin, aren't you? Well, I'm blessed with a whole lot of space. We have a humongous event room and then another uh, huge bar outside of our huge middle bar and then a huge room next to that other bar. So yeah. that's the that's our main revenue streams that we're looking forward to now. Right before COVID, we start getting a lot of calls to rent those out. And then, of course, COVID ruined that for a long time. But the phones are starting to heat up. But you have to get creative. Even the smaller, let's say a 12 lane center that just has a bar and a small kitchen, you need to think about your entire environment as an event space. Be booking that out. Look at how many downtimes you have, especially on the off months. There is the market share. And you and I talked about this last time. And I think you and I could get passionate over a napkin if it was the bowling center. Because no matter what we talk <laughs> about, I get passionate about. But you think about that 12-lane bowling center. Now it's April 30th. All the leagues are done. And they're like, oh, I'm going to start closing Wednesdays, Thursdays. Go market the heck out of your event space, which is your entire bowling center. You don't meetings, even have to turn the lanes fun, on. Happy Look at the hours. square footage you have. Look at the environment you have utilize those four walls. You're not just a bowling center, you're now an event space. So if you're not as fortunate as we are to have all that space, look at it differently, tweak it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Dustin Russell says, big perk for sure. Well, I'm sure you have a lot of event space in the casino uh, in, environment, but you're <laughs> right because you're drawing crowds that, you're drawing an event that may say, look, we don't, we're, we didn't exactly choose bowling as an activity, but we love mm -hmm. this space because we had multimedia presentation. We have the availability to have, you know, a dance floor, whatever it may be that they are looking to do and you can mm -hmm. fit it within your square walls look at how much is that revenue that you can afford to just say, no, nah, I don't want to deal with it because don't forget, they're going to buy alcohol. They're going to buy food. You might even be able to cater the event for them. So there's a lot of other ways to capitalize on just renting the space. You know, even if you're that center that has that one meeting room behind lane number 36, that used to be a playroom and is holding mm -hmm. all the ball racks and every old yeah. crack table you've ever had, mm -hmm. clean that crap out. Put it in the dumpster. You ain't using it. You're not using it. It's not going to happen. You don't need it. Make that room nice. Paint. Tile carpeting. Lighting good. And put a projection screen. That's all you need. And some yeah. chairs. You're good. Anyway, think about your space differently, especially what you said off peak. Yes. Okay. That brings us to inside. Well, I'm going to start with outdoor signage. 
Now, outdoor signage is not necessarily a revenue stream, is it? No, <laughs> it's not. But we've seen centers that have done this well and some that don't do it so well. And I have many examples, especially in the smaller markets in Wisconsin, how many bowling centers, they're in strip malls, they're tucked away, they're in old warehouse districts. You could drive by them and never know. Correct. The centers that do it, the centers that do it right, and this is a small percentage, so the opportunity is so there. And again, I'm getting very passionate. This is my napkin moment. Um, that if you're not, if you can't afford to do all the lighting and the big stuff, even painting your building, I bet you could still either stencil or somehow get a banner or something that makes people's heads turn that are driven by your center for the last 10 years. And all of a sudden they're like, well, what's that? Figure out those ways. Your building is your number one marketing thing to the traffic driving by. So sure. you have to find a way to capitalize on your outdoor signage. That's an investment and it will, if done right, drive revenue. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, if you have an outdoor sign that is structured in the right way, maybe you have digital signage available on there. You might be able to rent digital space out to mm. local businesses. You might be mm. able to uh, make some extra revenue off of your own sign if it's done right. I mean, I've seen that, you know, think Vegas when you're at a casino and they start doing the promos across there. The main casino sign doesn't go away. They're telling you about the activities going on inside. But if you're not in a casino town, if you're just like, you know, Joe's Bowl down the street and you're talking, you know, you're advertising for um, an auto repair place or whatever, an insurance company, these are customers of yours that come and like your place and you're a smaller community, this is the perfect fit for you. The same mm -hmm. type of mindset that you would use inside for your interior signage, i.e. monitor ads, i.e. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm all right, now I'm gonna go off because this is my thing. If, you, if you're go. talking, yeah, this is it. Inside <laughs> signage. I'm gonna have to put a big star next to this because I say antique, throw it in the garbage, don't do it. But I've seen uh, several people be able to pull it off and make it look right. So what I'm saying, what I don't like is when I walk into a bowling center where it is mostly traditional, it's not an FEC, and I see rake signs and signs stuck on the masking units that are different sizes and different mm -hmm. whatever, advertising mm -hmm. this business, that business, every other business. Mm -hmm. It's 63 feet away. I can't read the phone number or the <laughs> web address. I just, I mean, it's just like nobody had a thought, just give me $50 and I'll put your banner up in my building. Okay, you got 50 bucks from that. Great. <laughs> what does that make your building look like? Like some right. old flea market? No, I just don't think it's right all the time. But I have seen people take their digital monitor ads, you know, using their, uh, their overhead system for whatever their scoring system allows. They might have multiple sets. They might have scoring monitors. They might have extra monitors. They may have lower monitors. They might have, you know, you have monitors all up, up down the concourse. So I am a fan of partnering with those local businesses and saying, I'll give you an ad just like any other network uh, would do. Um, I'll give you an ad for, you know, X number of dollars a month. You can change it as you please. And it's nothing more than you need to provide me this digital ad that's this size. You give them the specifics and you just load it on a thumb drive or load it into your system and tell mm -hmm. it when to play and where to play. Easy breezy done. I got some money. It looks more professional. It doesn't look cheap. And now I'm okay with that. I think that works really well. And you can make a fair amount of extra money from that, right? Well, and to piggyback on your idea, I love that idea. The one thing that you definitely need to do is go shop that business first. Because similar when we partner with either a tattoo shop or a bike shop or a league, we don't want to send people and then they have a horrible experience. So it's like your pro shop. So make sure it's an ad or a place. You're going to take that money, but don't send somebody to a automotive shop and these guys are just jerks and condescending because now they're going to think about you. So yeah. make sure you shop those places. And if they're going to have an ad in your building, then they're giving away free games like crazy to their customers as well. Right. You know, it needs to be kumbaya very much. Every business Good grows, but it needs to be that. with the right business. But I, I love your idea. That. And you're really spawning me off that I still go into some centers and see they have these old school TVs or these monitors or even some newer TVs. And at a certain time, they're all turned off. off. So you just have a black screen, which I don't understand. Are we on a morgue? Are we operating you know, are going to a library? No, you're in an inviting, energetic environment. Turn those on, have something scrolling, make it entertaining. And if you're not investing now in overhead monitors, the nice sleek TVs, 43 inch screen, LVs yeah. are, are 229, $200. For a Put 43 those inch. in. Yeah. Put those in. Make sure they're all the same so you can use the same remote if you're not that high tech. 
and then make sure they have the zip drive um, or the USB. But that's a good investment, though. So the indoor signage, you're right on, Jay. I'm fully okay. on board. Um, so we covered uh, signage. Uh, we covered everything, really. Oh, big lane center square footage is one of the things I notes I had on there. We t you talked about this differently. You're saying, and I'm going to just kind of give people an update. So if you are a 48 lane center, like you are, do you need all 48 lanes? Are you full with the, you know, five nights a week? Is are, are you often on a waiting list with those 48 lanes, or could you get by with 40? And could you take that square footage the eight lanes has? remove them and convert that to another attraction, a mini golf, a climbing wall, a redemption, or whatever. I mean, it could be so many things now, right? Go to IAPA, get some ideas. Um, yeah. That is a larger decision to be made, but that actually pushes you into the future of entertainment, right? Because we know that we're, people are progressing ever so slowly from being, I'm a bowling center to, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a hybrid now. I, I have a, mm -hmm. a redemption I ha and I have really good food and beverage now. Well, now take it another step further. You know, do you, can you have something else? Is that the right move for your business? I encourage everybody who has large amount of lanes to look at that with a critical eye and say, maybe we can make this work and maybe we can become a more valuable one stop entertainment destination rather than mm -hmm. just an activity. And that's like where you want to be. That's where Dustin Russell wins every single day. You know, he's the bowling center inside of a casino that has 18,000 mm -hmm. places to eat and a spa and all these other things. So if I'm going to go there, I'm going there for the day. I'm going to go bowl. I'm going to mm -hmm. bowl a tournament. I'm going to play some games. I'm going to go get a massage. I'm going to have this amazing food. Like that's what Vegas is about, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have mini Vegas in Topeka, Kansas, if you want, without the gambling or with the gambling. Depends on what you have, you know, but that's what people in general look for is on uh, that's everything that's being built now brand new andretti's uh even the, the new main events the new bullet they're not putting in you know 30 lanes and a snack bar nobody's building that facility anymore mm -hmm. nobody and then there's a reason because that's limiting your availability it's limiting your revenue it's limiting your audience you're not competing with what's out there right now so if you have that and you're looking to change your business model or figure out how you can progress, this may be one of the ways, removing some lanes and using the square foot for something else. All well said, and I can go off in 12 tangents, but I'll keep it somewhat brief, somewhat. Okay. Um, so even outside of just the large centers, if you're debating on what do you wanna do with your spaces, I just kinda of wanna bring it even up another notch, another 10,000 feet. And this is gonna sound odd where I start next. I was walking through the mall and I walked past lens crafters. Mm -hmm. Lens crafters. Got these this there. lens, this lens crafters had two, probably eight foot wide ceiling to floor video walls displaying these really cool ads. Their seating is sleek and lower. Their chairs were stylish and cool. The paint, the updating. I stopped and looked, and I was like, "Holy moly! I want to go in there." There's excitement. There's feel. And if I go in there, even though I'm going to spend the exact same money there as a competitor then I feel better because I had this lush experience. I'm around nicer environments. That's what people want. If you're not updating and spending money, even on the cheap, and you can do this with lighting and paint and tearing stuff down, then mm -hmm. you're going to fall behind and you're either going one way or the other. You're either towards closing or you're towards succeeding. So I don't care what the space is, 48 lanes and take out those last eight, 12 lanes and figure out how to get more events in there. If you are not updating your center, and this can just be paint and lighting and sound or some TVs or as much as you have in the budget, then I'm telling you, coming out of COVID, we were all in survival mode. You need to get out of survival mode. You need to get in, where's the future going? So you're either just hanging around. And if you're just hanging around, you're not watching this. You're, you're probably opening up at three o'clock and close Wednesday, Thursday in the summer. But if you're here and you're here for the long term, start updating your center. Paint, lighting, and if you can do more, more. Energy, people want to be around nice environments. Do it. There's all these you different can, ways to do it. You can make such an impact with paint. Remember, remember uh, airport lanes in Buffalo. When I walked God. in there, it was like a trailer park exploded. There was oh carpet God. from 1960. <laughs> there were uh, carpet on the wall from 1975. You know, mm -hmm. you can easily, with very little um, involvement from contractors and whatnot, depending of obviously on your local restrictions, because I know some yeah. places you need a permit to put a bathroom sign on the door. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but 
just changing the aesthetics of your business makes such a big impact. You are a gigantic fan of lighting as well as I am, and especially my home. My my uh, my husband freaks out about <laughs> me freaking out about the light because I don't. I mean, light is not light. There's different kinds of light. Light uh, light projects emotion. Light light brings you um, focuses on things and energy. Energy, it, it changes the feel of the game. So, 100%. you know, your lighting in your bowling center is no different. You know, no, I, no. I remember when uh, Bullmore put in the bug lights, as I called them on the mm -hmm, concourse, the gels. it drove yep. me crazy at the beginning yep. um, because they didn't have it fully realized. They had started a dark. concept, it was too yep. dark. But yep. now you walk in and you're like, this makes complete sense to they me. They got it. Like, yeah. it works. They changed the mood. They made it feel mm -hmm. eclectic. They made it feel modern. And that's, yeah. you know, and they took, it's the same building, it's the same light pictures they had before, uh -huh. you know? So there's a way yeah. to, there's a, when there's a will, there's a way. And if you're not taking steps to make your business, like you said, you're either on this slide or you're on this slide. We're, that's up to you. That is completely up to you because it doesn't matter what your market is. You can be in the worst market possible. Somebody's going to survive in that market. Somebody's going to thrive in that market. You have to choose to be that person that wants to survive and is willing to take the steps to do that, whatever they may be. We don't know what that is for you. You figure that out, but you can't figure it out by saying no. And no. that brings us to inside uh, outdoor uh, inside signage with the nose. Oh this gosh. Is, uh, all right. We talked about this once before. I'm going <laughs> to let you, I'm going to give you a minute and a half on the no. Tell people about no. I can't even I can't even go into it. As I said last time when we bought the big center that we're at now, I think I counted the number of no signs. So no outside food or drink, no carry-ins as they call in um, Wisconsin. Love the carry-ins. Um, no shoes here, no shoes there. Don't pass this foul line. No kids over here. No, no, no. It was probably four thousand times. You, no matter where you looked, you were being told no. Stop with the no signs. Get rid of all of them. If you must have one for an insurance reason, I find that odd but maybe put that, but put it more sleek or make it humorous. The people that survived COVID best, they didn't have these mask mandates and no, 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 no. They made it quip or made it funny because we all knew nobody was under a rock. So take a walk around your center and look how many times you're telling customers no and find another way to do it. Ideally in person with your personality. Nobody wants to be told no. Jay, if you go somewhere and you want to return something or you're mad about a product or you're going to ask a question, do you as an adult male ever want to be told no? Yeah, no, well, mm, zero, mm, zero to 60. Mm. What you want to be told is, oh my God, I totally get that. And I'm so sorry, but we, do you know what I mean? It's yeah, all in want, the delivery. It's the do delivery. Do it in person. Let people come to you and you can go to them. It's a little more yeah. exhausting, but you will stomp the competition if you're the person around that stops saying no, especially by print. Yeah, yeah, I agree. A good point. Very good point. Very good point. We have one more. Um, topic on here. Oh, oh, I forgot about franchise food and beverage. I didn't even talk about that in the food and beverage. I'm just going to go quickly. If you are updating your food and beverage, or if you have a good food and beverage, have you considered looking into franchising uh, and, and looking at some of that opportunity? What I mean by this, I've been in bowling centers that have um, a subway. Remember uh, the one, mm. one in Buffalo had a subway. Um, the subway brought in traffic. It was really interesting. It was off to the side of the bowling center. It wasn't mm -hmm. actually in the bowl. It was like you had to walk through a door to get there, but it was hooked to the bowl. And I've seen other bowling centers have different franchise food and beverage options with inside. If I were to build a center tomorrow, there's no doubt in my mind, it would have a ginormous Starbucks sign <laughs> and I would have, I would, I would absolutely have, I wouldn't pay Starbucks. I wouldn't pay Starbucks. Uh, I wouldn't have a Starbucks. Maybe, maybe I would, but I would definitely be using branding and uh, putting familiar products in my business that people mm. gravitate towards, because mm -hmm. I think there's value in that. Even if you have a robust food and beverage uh, option already, you're probably already partnering with some of these vendors. You're probably having certain types of beer, or if you sell, you know, mm. really high end sandwiches, you're probably using boar's head. You know, I'm just making some of this stuff up as I go, but think about that carefully and how you can use uh, franchise or branding other products within your building to increase that revenue, increase the customer satisfaction and offer a higher level product. And that's the end of the day. That's what you're trying to do. And with some of these options, Dan, like we talked about, you know, outdoor signage, carpet, flooring, seating. We didn't really talk about that house balls and having crappy house balls on the rack that people come in and just dump their donated stuff in there. You don't want all that. That may not be a revenue option, but it certainly can detract from revenue, can it? Oh my gosh. Yes. It's all about your image and your feel. 
and they're not going to come back to you if the guy up the road has brand new house balls, better looking shoes and nicer staff. You're done. It's the way it is. So yeah. uh, tweaker antique. I think we've about tweaked an antique just about everything <laughs> so far today. So, you and I uh, like to tweak everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more tweak. Very few antiques. Very few antiques. Because look, at, we're the kind of people that say, let's try to make this work. If there is works. a decent idea, what can I extract from that that I will keep yeah. and then just yeah. get rid of the stuff that doesn't work anymore? And I think antique, that's the right mentality. Antique the old school thinking. There's a lot of old school thinking around here. So antique that. Got it. Well, now that you are, are on your way out the side here because you twisted your video by accident. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, Okay. We're at the end of the show today. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for joining us for another edition of Tweaker Antique. <laughs> on behalf of Cubica AMF, myself, Jay Nephew, and our guest host today, Dan Patterson, thanks for joining us. You have Hi, a guys. wonderful day. We'll see you maybe live from Vegas. I don't know. Let's do a show Ooh, from Vegas. We'll do a, we might do a little shout out. We'll see. All right, guys. <laughs> until next time. Uh, next week, Dottie San Martino will be back. She's got a special guest and uh, yeah and in two weeks i'm gonna have deandra as baby oh it's gonna be good beyond the lanes not oh beyond i the love frame. that you're She's so clever De deandra yeah. she is one cool chick let me just tell you oh yeah yeah you guys take care have a great uh weekend and do what's right for you and your business and keep yourself in the right frame of mind okay guys take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye jay